Turn your cameras on. Sorry to all our viewers at home. Uh, Tony, turn your camera on. There we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. So sorry to all the viewers at home. We had a bit of a technical difficulties um, tonight, but uh, we're here. Thank God. Um, so good evening to all the viewers at home. A uh, special welcome to all our live viewers uh, watching uh, Perusia, along with other groups. I know Razor Crusade uh, streaming live uh, cast there as well. Uh, Tony, big hello. How are you doing, mate? Doing tonight? Good, good, thanks. Yeah, it's good to be back. Good to be back on a Friday again. And tonight, um, to you all, Louis, can you hear me? Yeah, mate. Yeah, I can hear you, buddy. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Tonight, where we're jam-packed, we, we've started a little bit late, so we've got to cram it all in, but it's going to be a good night, a great talk. And as we said in the video a couple of nights ago, that this is a reoccurring topic that keeps coming up. Um, and tonight's the night for it to answer a lot of questions, but to also be, you know, um, inspired and to, you know, be formed in, in the sacrament of, of confession in whatever way, shape or form the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts. So, um, I'm really honored to be speaking and to introduce our speaker, Father Louis Barricat, because I remember Father, I'm pretty sure before he was actually Father, or he could have just been Father, we went to World Youth Day in Brazil. Um, I remember those times and the impact Father had with his young students there, it was phenomenal. And they really, to this day, some, some still ask about who was that, you know, that, 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 that youngish priest at the time. Father, just remind me, were you a priest then or were you? I was a seminarian just before I was ordained a deacon. There you go. And, and the impact, you know, your faithful witness to, to your calling has, has really touched many. So, Father, welcome to the Defend the Faith panel. Thanks very much, Tony. It's great to be with you and to be with you, Louis, too, my namesake. So it's really good to be with yeah. both of you tonight. Very good company. <laughs> awesome. Father, could you, could you lead us in an opening prayer, please? Absolutely. So we come together as children of God. Let's pray in the words that Jesus has taught us. First, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So, guys, last week, last week we had uh, Jesse Romero on the show. Um, yeah, for all the people who viewed, I mean, the response was enormous. Um, uh, as Jesse promised, he'll be back again, um, God willing, in about a month's time. But uh, however, tonight we're going to have a bit of a follow-on, a follow-on from last week. Um, you all do remember that Jesse Romero actually did say that, you know, confession is one of the most powerful forms of uh, exorcisms. And um, as St. Shabal says, you know, confess your sins and you'll kill the evil that's in you. Um, so tonight, as Tony said, we're going to get into the topic of confession as a follow-on from last week. Uh, we've got Father on here, as Tony has mentioned, and we're going to get straight into it. So, uh, Tony, over to you. Yeah, so if you do have questions throughout the talk, uh, we will take them as long as they are really relevant to, to the topic. However, if it's a really itching question, um, and, and we will discern whether or not we should ask it in, in the actual presentation. Um, but... Be formed, get your Bibles ready. We might go through some scripture as well. Um, we'll have some resources to show you that I'll explain um, later on. Um, she probably didn't say that quite well. Hold, hold up against your chest, Tony. Uh, there we go. There we go. Some of these yeah. um, great little resources that we can hand out to you all. Um, but yeah, so if you do have questions, type them in the comment section um, and then we can go from there. Father, um, it's, it's over to you. All right, here we go. So thanks very much for the introduction. Today I'm here to talk to you about something that means a lot to me as both a penitent and also as a priest. I'm here to talk about one of the sacraments of the church and that is what we call the sacrament of 
reconciliation. Before we go into reconciliation, let's talk about sacraments. The first thing for all our viewers to think about is what a sacrament is. A sacrament is something that is instituted by God for his people. So this talk tonight and me talking about confession is not just about trying to explain something that I've read on a piece of paper. But what I'm trying to do is invite you as a viewer, as a human being, to come into the reality of what God himself is inviting you to share in, and that is life with him. So a sacrament is a visible sign of the invisible reality of God. God's way of bringing us into a real share in his divine life, even whilst we are still here walking our human path on earth. So that's what a sacrament is. And when we talk about the sacrament of reconciliation, we're talking about being reconciled. It's in the name. So who are we seeking to be reconciled with? And the answer to that question is, of course, God, first and foremost. Each and every one of us has to face the reality that at times we don't feel so connected with God. And more than just feel, sometimes we aren't very connected with God. And so we need a way to come into not only connection, but a real union with God, Holy Communion being the highest expression of that. But this sacrament today is one that prepares us for that union. This sacrament today is one that disposes us well to receive that gift of the Eucharist that God wants to give us so that we can share in his divine life. So the first thing is to recognize our need, our need to be reconciled. So I'm going to go to scripture and I'm going to say that this point is not something that's new, right? We heard it announced from the very beginning. John the Baptist in sacred scripture is a loud voice, a courageous voice at the time. And he's saying to people, repent, repent and be baptized. And so this is something that John the Baptist was strong about in his ministry. He preaches a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It says that clearly in Luke's gospel. You can look it up, chapter 3, verse 3. So John's announcing this need for baptism for the forgiveness of sins need to be repentful and people come people don't just hear it and say thanks for the message john i'm just going to go off and do my own thing people come and people are being baptized by john so the precursor to christ the one who is preparing the way of the lord is already making it very clear to all the people at the time that hey you need to repent now, that might sound strong, but why does he say that? And why do so many people respond to it? It's because people know. They know that they fall short of not only the teachings of God, the commandments that were given in the old law, but also they know within themselves that they don't live up to their own ideals. They don't live up to their own goals and we can relate to that too, I'm sure, as human beings. So in our humanity, there is a need, a desire to reconcile even within ourselves what we want to do with the reality of what we're actually doing. Sin is this disintegration. Sin is kind of when we divide even within ourselves. We divide our relationship with God, we divide our relationship with the church, with others. Whoa, it's gone dark. <laughs> I just knew. And then God said, let there be light. How do I get that, Tony? It should, it should just come on if you walk around. There yeah. we go. <laughs> i tell you what, i tell you what, Father and Tony, we had some, some technical issues tonight. So 
We'll keep pushing through it. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. No, we're doing good. A lot <laughs> coming off. Every now and again in that room, we might have to do a couple of star jumps and then uh, just to that, just in case that light turns back off. I'll bring back my personal training days, time. There you go. So just going back to talking about that that division, that disintegration. Um, you know, repentance helps us acknowledge that to find union again, to become integrated people. And we can't just do that on our own. We can't. Um, even with our best intentions, people at New Year's Eve, for example, set resolutions. I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, this year I'm going to go to the gym five days a week. I'm going to, you know, eat a good piece of steak and rice and I'm going to abstain from anything fatty. All these kind of things that people might set themselves up to do and then sadly sooner or later they find you know even that simple goal I set I'm struggling with so there's a lack of integrity in our human pursuit of excellence we need help so when John preaches and offers help people come people who are willing to accept help come and they're starting to experience something. And that is an openness to what God has to offer. How do we know this? Because very soon, God is going to walk into the scene in the person of Jesus Christ. And John's going to point him out and say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that's what people want. People want their sins to be taken away. And so they're able to follow Jesus. They're able, because of what John has prepared them to receive, go in the direction that Christ himself will call them. Well, just before you go on there, I think it's a really important point for our viewers to understand is that you're building onto something that is happening before Christ has walked onto the scene. So you're building up to this anticipation that's going to come soon. But it's this idea that even in the Old Testament, even in reading the book of Ezekiel, you know, chapter 36, you read about people with the washing of for the forgiveness of their sins. This wasn't just a New Testament um, Catholic in the year 300. They invented this idea. And I don't want to jump the gun there, but I just want to re-emphasize this to our viewers that there was a repentance of sin, a washing away that was practiced by the Jews. Mm. And got to remember that everything in the Old Testament, okay, is fulfilled or is, a, is, is portrayed or foreshadowed to happen in the New Testament. So, but, it, but even on a greater level. So I just want to make that point clear um, to our viewers that, um, yeah, that, that's something you're building on there. So yeah, we'll, we'll continue from there. Absolutely. The point being is that there is a certain need for the forgiveness of sins that Christ has come to accomplish, right? So first and foremost, humanity has to recognize within itself its struggle with sin, which is why we hear the call repent said by the precursor to Christ and Jesus himself will then take up that same mission. But of course, everything that was in the Old Testament is made new by Jesus also. It's not the same. What Christ offers us is greater. What Christ offers us is the fulfillment of everything that was there in preparation for what Jesus wants to give us. So you're right that in the Old Testament, God still wanted to forgive people of their sins, and he sure did. And he provided ways for people to find forgiveness. God himself and God alone is the one who forgives sin. And that's something I need to emphasize. And perhaps I'm jumping in a bit early here because I'm building up to who Jesus is. right? So God alone forgives sins. This is believed by the Jewish people before the coming of Christ. But it's important to recognize that even with that same belief that God alone forgives sins, you've already mentioned a passage from Ezekiel, 
but also in the book of Leviticus, we hear about how God wants people to come to discover his forgiveness. So Leviticus chapter 19, verses 20 to 22 states, If a man lies carnally with a woman, they shall not be put to death, but he shall bring a guilt offering for himself to the Lord. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before the Lord for the sin which he has committed shall be forgiven him. So God alone forgives sins. And yet here we have a clear example in the Old Testament how God is willing to give us forgiveness through an agent of his how he mediates his forgiveness through one that he has sent to do this with him. So God works with us to help us experience the fullness of his life. It's not just something we imagine or contemplate from afar. It's something that we can also experience within our full humanity, which is not only spiritual, but bodily too. So the Jews wouldn't disagree with us when we say that only God forgives sins. In fact, it's what leads them to accuse Jesus of something radical. And so I'm going to move now to the healing of the paralytic. And this is a beautiful image in sacred scripture. And I want to just read this passage from Scripture out to you. If you want to look up in your Bibles, you can go to Mark's Gospel and we'll read chapter 2 together. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even about the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, child, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. What does this man, why does this man speak like this? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they questioned like this within themselves, said to them, Why do you question like this in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your pallet, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet and go home. And he rose and immediately took up the pallet and went out before them all. So that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So this is a really powerful scene in sacred scripture. First, Jesus is teaching, and that itself shows that he has some authority. Yeah? You need to have some authority to, to be able to teach. And Jesus comes and says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him by his father. So Jesus is the ultimate authority. His teaching and his astounding people with his teaching. And there's something in his teaching that draws people towards him, even those who were deemed most helpless. A paralytic couldn't move. His life was stagnant. He wasn't going anywhere until he hears the teaching of Jesus Christ. And so I want to say to our listeners too, anyone who feels like their life isn't really going anywhere, that it's become somewhat stale or stagnant, Christ has something 
to free you and that will give you the power to go forth to do things that you have never done before. And Jesus shows that what that man needs above all is not just the healing of his body. When he sees him and he looks upon him with that incredible gaze, that gaze of love, he gives him what he knows he needs more than anything else. He gives him what people have heard him announcing in the past, the need to repent that was announced prior to Christ's coming by John the Baptist, Jesus now comes to give forgiveness. And so he looks at that paralytic and says, your sins are forgiven. And what a powerful moment. He says something that the Jews immediately recognize only God can do. And so they accuse him of the highest charge against the human being. Blasphemy. You are making yourself out to be God, Jesus. And Jesus doesn't shrink from their accusation. He says, what would have been easier to say your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk? Of course, it would have been easier to just say your sins are forgiven. How's he going to make a paralyzed person stand and walk? But he did do that to prove that he has the power the authority to forgive sins and so he tells the man get up pick up your pallet and go home and that's what happens the encounter with jesus the forgiveness of his sins has freed him now to live in a new way and that way is according to the way of jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. And just before I finish on this gospel passage, Tony, at the very end, you know, when people are amazed, what did they do? They were amazed and they glorified God. It doesn't say they were amazed and glorified the person that was standing in front of them, Jesus. It says they glorified God. They saw in the person standing in front of them something that only God can do. And so this was a great revelation from Jesus about himself as the second person of the Trinity, as the one who has come to set us free from sin. So God alone forgives sins. God in the man, Jesus Christ, forgives sins and that's a scandal for the people at the time and you know what the idea that god would forgive through a human body is still a scandal today it still scandalizes people that a human can say those words today that your sins are forgiven. Now, in some way, it should scandalize us because only God can do that. But if God himself has chosen to forgive us through the words uttered by a human he has chosen for the task, then we have to grapple with that. We have to say, do we really believe all that Christ came to do and is willing to still do in and through our humanity? So that moves me now on to why we can believe God wants us to go to confession to the apostles today. Brother, before you jump into that, I just want to um, jump in here and, and cross-reference Matthew chapter 9. Um, Matthew chapter 9 is the same story. Yeah. And the gospel writers, when they write, obviously their audiences are different. So in the, in the gospel of Matthew, it's all about you know, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He teaches with authority and, and so on. And, and I've got it here in front of me. You were talking about how when they, how that bit of the gospel ends and they glorified God. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter mm -hmm. 9, verse 8, it reads mm -hmm. this. It says, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God, 
who had given such authority to men. Yes. Yep. And you were speaking about how Christ forgives him as a man in his human nature. And I think you're going to, to allude to this soon to the apostles, but yep. I just want to emphasize that, that the same story. Now, the stories don't contradict each other at all. It's the same story, but from a different angle, from a different narrative point of view, from a different in, from a different take they had given such authority to men and that's really that's really profound that christ in his humanity passes on that authority which is as you have said only usually only attributed to god in the, in the in the jewish understanding that's right you know and and it's important to emphasize that jesus in forgiving people whilst he worked on earth did that because he is the god man <laughs> So it's because he is divine person uh, and it's in his human interaction with us that he gives us this divine authority. So let's talk about then why go to a priest today? You know, a priest isn't Jesus is what anyone would probably want to say to that. You know, if Jesus was walking amongst us, okay, I, I'll go to Jesus. But I know that a priest isn't Jesus, so why should I go to a priest? Well, this is where we need to, again, be willing to walk a new way, and that is the way of Jesus himself. You know, the sacraments are not something thought up by clever human beings. The sacraments are divinely instituted, the church teaches time and time again throughout her history. The sacraments are given to us by God himself as the way he desires for us to walk with him. So whilst your channel is called Defend the Faith, Tony, I was thinking about this. I really believe that anyone who doesn't want to follow the way that Jesus himself has instituted need to try to provide some kind of justification or defense for that position. Because I'll show you now in Scripture how it's not what Jesus wanted. Jesus has given us a way to come to him, to experience his mercy, to experience his forgiveness. And in a way, by rejecting the sacrament of reconciliation, we're saying, no thanks, Jesus, I'll just do this part my own way. And I don't think everyone would say that to Jesus if they knew what he'd actually said about this. And so that's why now I want to talk about it. Christ, we know from all his followers, and he had thousands of people who walked with him, thousands who wanted to see what he had to show and also hear what he had to say. But only 12 of them he chose to take aside, to teach in a more intimate way, perhaps a more personal way, everything that he wanted them to then go out and teach in his name. So Jesus chooses 12 from the very beginning. We learn about that. And he chooses a mixed bunch, right? He does not choose 12 perfect people. He chooses 12 people, each with their own probably gifts, undoubtedly, but also flaws and struggles. Everything that you can imagine when you grab a room full of people. There will be a variety of personalities, a variety of attitudes amongst the group. And just as a bit of an aside, I don't know if you've watched the series Chosen um, a lot of people are talking about it. It's an online series at the moment. But it kind of gives you some insight into the lives of the 12, all the people that Jesus chose to follow him. But anyway, not to be too distracted. So with this 12 he has with him, remember Jesus had said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given unto me. Then we have an interesting exchange between Jesus and the 12 in particular with Simon Peter. And this is a good time for me to stand up because I want to show you this picture at the back here. This picture is when Jesus has been asking the people, you know, who do the people say that 
the son of Manes. And some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then Simon Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus looks at him and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. You are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And the gates of hell, he promised, will never prevail against the church. Now, that's a remarkable exchange. Jesus is giving a divine authority to a fisherman from Galilee. So God is willing to give or institute this divine office, you could say, in a human way. So that's a bit of a beginnings, all right? So we, we've got this authority of Christ being given to those he had chosen to lead his church. Now, after Jesus dies for our sins, rises from the dead, ascends to heaven yeah rather before he gives them the great commissioning go out into all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son the holy spirit and teach them all that i have commanded you jesus had appeared to them too when they were gathered in the upper room this was after the death of jesus there is fear in the hearts of his followers there is fear over what lies in store for them. And I imagine there would have also been fear about the consequences, even for some of them, of their denying him, you know, having run away when he was persecuted. So there's all kinds of reasons that they, they would have been afraid. And so I just want to pick up from that scene. So if we go to John chapter 20. Verses, I will read from John chapter 20, 19 onwards to 23. So after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then, his, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So post-resurrection, we're in this new chapter. Jesus has completed his mission on earth. We're in this new phase for the followers of Jesus Christ. What are they to do? Well, Jesus meets them firstly in their place of fear. And that should speak to a lot of us who might be afraid of the sacrament of reconciliation. Jesus wants to speak to us where we are shut up, where we are locked up, where we don't want anyone to see us. Jesus enters into that space and says, peace be with you christ wants to set us free from that and we hear about how the apostles and mary those who are gathered in the upper room they're suddenly filled with joy at having received god they go from fear to joy and that's something that's in store for anyone who is willing to receive what jesus has to offer especially in the sacrament of reconciliation but what christ then says to them when he breathes upon them, it's a very powerful gesture. You imagine Jesus standing over you and just going, 
Yeah, like you, you look farther, like you know, like if you read there saying that yeah, you know, he breathed on them. Yeah, like you know that when God breathes, something big is gonna happen. Like you look at Genesis 2 7, when God breathed into the nostril and brought the breath of life into a person. Yeah. So when God breathes, something big is gonna happen. So at that point, you know, Jesus knew exactly that he's about to give and do something really big. Louis, you know, when God breathes, he gives us life. You you nailed it. And so Jesus has come. What's he do? Does Jesus come to destroy life? No, of course not. Jesus comes to give us life to the full. Yep. And you see, the life that we receive from God in the beginning had been affected by sin. You know, And that's the reality that we all had to contend with. And unless we recognize the need for ourselves to be saved, we'll have no need for a savior. But if we take an honest look upon ourselves and see that there are many things within ourselves that need purifying, that need to still be perfected, that need reconciliation with God, then we come to see Jesus offers that. And not only, not only does Jesus give us that, he has made sure that the church's mission is to continue to make sure that reconciliation is offered for all people. So in a sense, when God breathed life into the world, Jesus now breathes this new life into the world, this life that gives hope to sinners, this life that will bring healing to the wounded, this life that will reconcile the fallen world to the creator and loving God that we have. And he'll do that through broken instruments like the apostles. Well, that, that's a really interesting point you make. I mean, in, in our church, it completely comes under the sacrament of healing. Um, and sin destroys us. Yeah. Sin breaks off our communication with God. Sin breaks off our relationship with God. Whether we know it or not, it's broken. When Adam sins in Genesis, it, it, God says, do not eat from that forbidden tree or you shall die. When they eat the forbidden fruit, they don't die. You know, they're still walking around. So what kind of death does it mean? Mm. You know, what kind of death is it alluding to? And it's the spiritual death. Yeah. And it's the same with sin in our life now. Sin destroys our spiritual life and it needs that sanctifying grace that we can only receive in confession for the mortal sins to be sanctified again. But I think that's a really important point to make that. And, and when we look around at a world of sin as well, we need to, we need to be prepared and we need to also humble ourselves and say, okay, I'm not a perfect person. The priest I'm confessing to isn't a perfect person, but he's the one that has given that authority, which father you have spoken about in those in the, in the parables that you've mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And so, it's important that we see, guys. So going back to the question, you know, like why would I go to a priest? Is because God wants you to, you know, not because the priest is better than you, not because the priest himself doesn't need to go to confession. I said before, this is an important topic for me, both as a penitent, one who confesses his own sins and need for forgiveness, but also as a priest, as a confessor, one who only by the grace of God Almighty and the sacrament of ordination that I have received have the great honor of being a dispenser of God's mercy, of being an agent of his forgiveness on earth. And so if we can talk a little bit more about that, then I think that would be good uh, for our viewers, for people to listening. Having heard the biblical foundations and reason for why we do need forgiveness, why God alone can forgive sins, and why God has chosen this particular way for us to know we are forgiven. I think that's very important, that you can see its foundations in Scripture. It's what the early church has practiced and taught and faithfully transmitted throughout the centuries still to the present day. In our Catholic Church, yep, you got. I mean, you got Saint Paul back in Second Corinthians five eighteen, 
saying that all oh, this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. 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 And, and to, to just build as well the New Testament understanding, of course, Jesus Christ, who is both God and man, he is the one true mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ is the one who gives us the grace of forgiveness. It's not the priest who gives it to you, except that he does through what Jesus himself is doing. And so when people go to confess, they're actually going to confess to God. They're not going to meet with me. Why would anyone want to tell me personally, hey, come over. Let's just talk about all the bad things that I'm struggling with. All right, there's some good in that, but we're not about to just do that with anyone, especially someone we've never met. But when we go to confession, we go knowing that it's to God we want to confess. We want to speak out loud what has been hidden in our hearts. And we can do that with confidence when we go to the sacrament of reconciliation precisely because that priest is acting in the person of Jesus Christ. That priest is not there to talk to you just on a personal level that is in a way disconnected from his priesthood, but rather he does it through his ministry as a priest, which is why talking to me outside of the sacrament of reconciliation is something very different to talking with me inside the sacrament of reconciliation. And the church has always taught that and protected that by placing what we call the sacred seal on confession. One of the most sacred institutions throughout history has been the seal of the confessional, that nothing that is ever spoken of or heard in the sacrament of confession would ever be repeated. And if it was, it was so serious that the church would excommunicate that priest. That's not just saying, dear priest, you are no longer a priest. It's saying, dear priest, you have cut yourself off the grace of Jesus Christ and his church, and you are on the path to damnation unless you yourself repent and turn back to God's way. So it's a huge, a huge statement that the church is making here. The priest could never break the seal. He can never repeat, even to the one who has confessed to him in confession. The priest, if you're wondering why he might not bring things up when you see him later on uh, outside of the confessional, perhaps, it's because he can't. It's because what you had confessed there was done on holy ground, on sacred ground, that he has no right to enter into unless you invite him in. So that's but, something I'll, yeah. Sorry, but I was just going to say, like, it's a statement, and I also want to get your thoughts on this. Like, quite often, I, I hear a lot, you know, especially from Catholics. Yes, we've got our Protestant brothers and sisters that say the lot, you know, why do I have to confess to a man? I confess directly to God. But I also hear a lot of Catholics also saying that, saying, you know, what, why do I need to confess uh, to a man? I, you know, I, I just, you know, God knows my sins. You know, and then, uh, you know, I'm forgiven. I, I hear that a lot. And what's troubling is that, like, there are people that I've met or I've, I've spoken to that they haven't, like, you ask them, when was the last time you went to confession? And they say, oh, I haven't been in 20 years, 30 years. Like, some people, like, this is their first Holy Communion. Mm. You know, that's the last time they've had confession. And a lot of it you know, is drawn down to, I don't need to confess to a priest. You know, God already knows my sins. And, and the other one is how embarrassing, like how embarrassing to go and, and, and tell, my sin, tell my sins to a priest, you know. Um, I heard this from a friend, like, yeah, yeah, it's embarrassing, you know. Like you look at, you know, we referred to Genesis a few times already, you know. But even like, you know, in Genesis 3, you know, when, the, you know, when the, after you know, they did what they did, they committed the sin and then you know god came and said you know what is it that you have done he actually asked them you know what have you done yeah of course god knows your sins he's god he mm -hmm. knows what you've done he knew what adam and eve done but he still asked them 
what have you done? Like he was demanding that confession from them. Yeah, he was asking for that confession. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, Father, is for people listening tonight, and, and I'm sure mm -hmm. a few people have said that, you know, I haven't been to confession since my Holy Communion or I need to speak to a priest. What would be your, your, your words to them tonight to say, hey, you better come to confession? Mm. Well, firstly, I'm going to share something that I think most priests would agree with. One of the happiest moments for me as a confessor is when I hear someone say, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been 5, 10, 15, 20 years since my last confession. It actually brings me joy. Why? Because they've come back. Yeah. It helps me so much when I hear someone who has wandered or strayed or been far away from the church has heard the call of Jesus Christ to come back. So if you are one of those who perhaps have been away for so long and you're embarrassed by it and you're afraid of what the priest might think of you, if you were to come and to tell him that, I want you to know that we are looking forward to welcoming you back to the sacrament of reconciliation, which is the throne of God's mercy. Think of the father who welcomed back the prodigal son. Think of how he ran out and embraced him and wanted to clothe him with the best robe and with a ring and to prepare a feast for him. That's the love that the priest gets to experience and witness when you come back to reconciliation, having been away for a long time. Please come back, not just because I want to hear your sins, but because God wants to free you from the burden of sin that has weighed heavily on your heart. Life's hard enough as it is. But for you to go about life trying to do it your own way, carrying the weight of your sins, holding secret and in the darkness of your heart, those things that you are most ashamed of, you should never live with that alone. And God knows you need to be freed from that. So, Louis, what I would say is that God doesn't need confession. God doesn't need the sacrament of reconciliation. He knows we need it. And so he's given it to us as a real help, as a way to actually receive forgiveness and to know it. And without us receiving it from Jesus Christ, we are at grave risk. To think that we are going to be on the good path our own without the assistance that God wants to give us, then like I said, we seriously need to justify that before God. It's kind of like God saying, hey, come in. I want to heal you. I want to help you. And you say, no, no, thanks, God. I'll be right. I'll be right over here. I kind of think of it like this. Imagine, you know, a good doctor and there are many out there who sometimes go to poverty stricken places where there is no or limited access to good health care. And they offer themselves freely. They go there and they offer what they have to give to help those people who are walking around with either a disability or some serious illness. And, you know, you might have seen this in documentaries when people come forward and they receive that free offer of someone's incredible skill to heal. There's a lot of joy in that. And we can even recognize that as uh, something beautiful to witness a human doing. But imagine then you saw people with serious disability or even illness who had that opportunity and then just said, no, nah, not for me. I don't want that. There's a certain sadness that exists, even if we were to deny health care that was being offered to us that we knew would improve our life, it would leave us with a certain sadness. So how much more then? <laughs> I'm just sort of getting the light going again. Hang on. And as I was saying, back into this picture, 
<laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a distraction. But I was saying, if we can recognize that with our physical health itself, right, how much more should we recognize the importance for our spiritual health? Can I, can I share a bit of a personal story, Louis, about this point? Absolutely. Yeah. So today, I don't think my friends will mind me saying this, but I, I celebrated uh, a memorial mass, the death anniversary of a dear friend of mine, uh, Jack, God rest his soul. I love Jack, and I still think about Jack and how much he desired uh, to be with God throughout his life, especially in the later stages when he struggled and battled with cancer. And I still remember Jack really being willing to fight the disease. And Jack was someone who wanted life. He, he loved life and he wanted to live. And I still remember when Jack would go to the hospital and he would be tested to see how the treatment was going. And I remember still when he received the text message or he received the news from the doctor that he was cancer free. And I remember how he sent me this happy message, cancer free, thanks be to God. There was something to really be joyful about there. You know, Jack desired health. And when he received news from a doctor that he had been freed from that disease, it gave him a real sense of joy. So even on a physical level, even on a bodily level, we ourselves know that when there's something wrong and we get treatment and that treatment removes that wrong or heals it, there's a reason to rejoice and to be thankful. Yeah. There's a reason to be glad. Well, if that's true for the body, then how much more is it true for that which gives life to the body? How much more is it true for our soul, for our spiritual life and well-being? Each of us has to take a real honest look about our lives and our hearts and in which direction we're being pulled and drawn and ask if it's not towards God, then there's a way to find ourselves back on the right path a way to be healed from whatever spiritual infirmity we might be struggling with due to sin. And the thing about this, Louis, that's different to a physical doctor. When one goes to a doctor, they go with some hope that there might be an answer for them. And sometimes they're left disappointed. Sometimes they're told there's nothing we can do. Or even at times when they think they've done everything they can, like Jack had heard he was cancer-free, it comes back. And sadly, it ended up being the cause of Jack's death, a real reason for grief. Yeah. But we have reason to find hope even in that grief. Because what's more important still than what the body experiences is, like I said, what the soul and the heart itself goes through. And Jack sought healing there. And he knew towards the end of his earthly pilgrimage that he was one with God, that he had received the gift that God wanted to give him through the anointing of the sick, through the sacraments of reconciliation, and through the Holy Eucharist to help him on his journey home to heaven. And I said to Jack, and I say it to all our listeners, if you would go to a doctor in the hope that they could do something for you, then why wouldn't you go to the priest knowing, not just hoping, knowing that God wants to give you forgiveness through the sacrament of reconciliation? I hope, brothers and sisters, especially if you've been away, you will come back to receive this great gift of healing, freedom from your sin, 
and knowledge of God's love for you, even in your sinfulness. Brother, just, just I know I know we started a few minutes late due to the technical issues and, and whatnot. So I want to spend maybe two, two or three minutes, Father, if we can. Beautiful reflections, you know. I think you've hit deep with a lot of listeners here. Say there is someone that's listening, Father, and you know that we've said maybe they haven't been to confession in two, three years, ten years. They've forgotten everything about confession. How would you say you someone could prepare? Like what's what's a good way to prepare for confession? Well, one of the ways is what Louis has very kindly put on the screen for us now, and that is an examination of conscience. So you can look up good Catholic resources online. Uh, there's an example of one right there. Guys, where you I'm happy. Don't... Sorry, Father. Guys, I, I know last time we did like a small like a segment, like confession came up in one of our talks, and, and I offered if anybody would like a copy of this one here, um, or you can search online um, on any like a Catholic page, but just private message uh, Tony, myself, Defend the Faith, with your email address, and I'm happy to email that to you. Sorry, Father, go ahead. No, that's good. I was going to say it's, it's great if we can provide a resource for them, so I appreciate you doing that, Louis. So an examination of conscience helps us to form our conscience, to be able to think with the mind of the church, to understand what it is that God is inviting us to share in, what kind of life he wants us to live, and to be honest about how we perhaps have rejected that offer, where in our lives we are seeking, if you like, our own comfort rather than being willing to follow the way of Jesus Christ. And some of us might be struggling with a particular sin and think, well, this is something that I could never give up on. This is something that uh, I've just become too used to throughout my life, and I don't think I could ever go without this. Well, meet Jesus Christ in the sacrament of reconciliation and see that he gives you something better. Sin can only distract us from coming forward to receive what we really desire, which is union with God. And that union which has been ruptured by sin and our bad choices is actually healed by Jesus and the gift of his grace in the sacraments. So I want you to come to receive the healing that God alone can give you. I want you to know there's more to life than you have yet discovered. And that's something to be excited by. Those who encountered Jesus Christ, like that paralytic man who had his sins forgiven, his life was changed forever. And so too, does God change our lives in the sacrament of reconciliation? Awesome. Really, um, I'm just want to bring up this resource I have in my hand here. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure. Hold, hold it on your chest, Tony. So that what? way it'll, yeah, it'll come. Yeah. Is that coming through? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, do you want to get rid of that screen share for one second, Louis? Just so, yep. so everybody can see it. Yep. There you okay. go. Now, I've ordered 15 of these books, Why Go to Confession? I mean, I've got them all here with me now, and I'm happy to post them out to the first 15 people, I guess, who ask for them. Um, it's got an examination of conscience and conscience in the back of it, but it's also got everything we've spoken about tonight in terms of the biblical side to confession, um, the human side of understanding confession. And it's written by an Australian priest, actually, Father John Flatter, who gives awesome talks and is part of the Archdiocese of Sydney, I believe. Is that right, Louis? Yep. Father Louis? He's an Opus Dei priest. He's actually not originally from Australia, I don't think. So apologies to Father John. I think he might come from the States or Canada. Or maybe that's a sin mentioning Canada. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but look, I've got them here. I've got them here. So I'll be happy to post them out to you all. It'll help you. And it, it also helps you explain to people what confession is and why Catholics have, have confession and believe in it. Um, so I think that's a really good resource to have. So I'm happy to post that out. Um, we're almost to the end of the of the show. Um, Louis, any kind of other announcements we need to make tonight? Or uh, like, I, I just want to say, like, I'm not bringing this up to to say, oh, look, you know, about this person, and I know they, they won't mind me telling this. But I just want to share a little story. I'm, I'm sure some of the listeners at home would re relate to this. And I'll make it very quick. So we we had a, a prayer night at our house. We had a, a priest come and, and he was doing some blessings at our place, 
Um, and I invited family members. Um, actually, uh, Charlie Bacos, you all know Charlie from DTF as well, was, was there at that night as well. And uh, there was one pre priest inside talking to everyone, and there was another priest you know, doing confessions. And um, we got on the topic of confession inside the room. And, and there was uh, someone there very dear to me was saying, I don't need to go to confession. I haven't committed any sins. Mm. Okay. So what, what Charlie did, and he did this in front of everybody. He got, on, he got on his knees in front of this person and he said, please, can you bless me? And the person's like, well, get off, what are you doing? Get off the ground. He's like, no, no, no. If you're sinless, then you're like Jesus. Bless me. And then, and then she's like, get up, get up, you know. And then Charlie said, you know, don't, don't say that, you know. And then we shared the examination of conscience to this person. And then they read it and their eyes just lit up and they're like, I need to go to confession, you know. So I know there are people out there that say, I don't need to go to confession. Or, or they haven't been to confession. But just at that moment there, that person realized, you know, the point that, that was made that night, okay? So, I think that also highlights the point of sin. Sin, sin can blind us. Sin can yeah. blind us from God's path. And, and the more we sin and the more we are in sin, the more we think that we aren't in sin. Um, and it's a, and, and, it, and it, require, it, it builds up this smoke screen in front of your eyes and you, you, come, you can't see the path of God anymore whether we think we know that or not i think and that's why that's why confession is so important here yeah i'm going to give you um another experience of mine as a priest outside of the confessional and that is uh, sometimes i get called to bless people's homes and i'm always uh, filled with gratitude when someone shows trust and invites me into their home a very personal space yeah and often there's a good meal, perhaps, to go with it, or most importantly, good company. It's what I look forward to every time I visit people at home. But then when I go around to bless the house, I always ask, you know, the parents to lead me around the house. Lead me through the home that you want blessed by God. And so they would. They would take me through every room, you know. Now, sometimes... Sometimes it might happen that they haven't prepared their bedroom, that the bedroom has a mess, the laundry, there might be even dirty clothes lying on the floor. And I can see as they approach the kind of look they're giving to each other. Oh, do we let him in there? Should we go in there? Like, Let me tell my know, son, Gerard, are you listening? Are you listening to it? Yeah. Especially in like in the Middle Eastern culture, you know, we can't sleep. <laughs> You know, but I always say to them, don't be afraid. Whatever you want blessed, I'm here to bless. I'm not here to judge how clean your house is. Yeah. I'm not here right now to sort of pinpoint whether this should have been in that drawer, that drawer. Right now, I'm here to bless your house. Now, when I go into every single space that is made visible to me by the family they know that their house was blessed but i think it does them even more good knowing that god was willing to bless even their mess yeah. that god was willing to enter into that space that they were perhaps embarrassed about and ashamed to reveal and so that every time if they found themselves in that place again, they might remember, oh, but God came and blessed this. Yeah. And I think that's a really beautiful image to have, you know, if that door was to have remained shut. And let's just think of like, it might have been another room in the house, a small space that they were afraid to enter in themselves. But the priest said, let's go in and bless that space. Then every other time they go into that place, they know God has been there. God has been willing to enter into that space. Now, I'm not in any way claiming to be God, of course, but as an agent of giving his blessing, I'd like, like to that, think an that, agent. Yeah, as, as I'd like to think that people recognize too, when you go to confession, that you don't have to keep anything hidden. 
that you can open up that room that you're perhaps most embarrassed about so that when you find yourself in that place, if you ever do again, you don't have to be afraid. You know God will meet you there and lift you out of that space to live with him. So I leave that with you. I love and that. A beautiful, beautiful way you just explained that. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Look, I, I think, guys, we could, we could go on. We could go on. But I think um, let, let, let's call it a night for now. That that's probably just over an hour. Um, to our viewers, to our listeners, we hope you've taken something away from this. Um, we, we're here to, you know, obviously, you know, form and defend the faith, but to provide the faith in, in a way in these situations where, if it means we do it online, then we will continue doing this online, you know, on, on Friday night. So you always stay tuned for the posts that come throughout the week um, from Louis and myself. Um, and resource-wise, I'll, I'll just emphasize again, if you did need one of these books, you can put a comment in the section. Um, but again, thank you all for listening. Um, Louis, thanks for doing everything you're doing. Should we, is there any other announcements we need to make to our uh, listeners? Yeah, we've got, um, we've got, I think we've got Charlie on Christian Live Matters, I think. I'm not sure. Charlie, on, on Sunday with the Abunas. I think that's happening. Check that out. Um, but other than that, I just want to say uh, Father Louis, awesome name, by the way, again. Um, mate, it was awesome having you here, Father, and we'd love to have you back here again. Um, the views have been strong all night. Uh, like Tony said, we can go on all night. And I really, really want to personally thank you for coming on here. We look forward to having you here again, God willing. It's my great pleasure to be with both of you guys. And I want to thank you as a priest for what you're doing, uh, responding to your call to holiness and for being a witness in the world, especially in this online space where we need good witness. We need the truth to be made known to people in an online world that is filled with falsehoods. So thank you both for being willing to do that. And I want to say also to all our viewers that everything that is provided on this online platform is to help you enter into the real life that Jesus offers you. The sacramental life, your priests are waiting for you. And if they're not in any way showing you that they're open to hear confessions, you let them know that you want it too. And try to encourage your priests who might need a bit of a shake up and encouragement from yourself as well. We need that from time to time too. We have confessions available at St. Mary's Cathedral where I'm currently ministering as an assistant priest every day except Sunday. So you can come to confessions between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. from Monday to Friday or 4.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. during this time of COVID. Yeah, I love it. Also on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. and 4.30 p.m to 5.30 p.m. We get many confessions at the cathedral. You can come anonymously, so you don't have to worry about uh, revealing your identity even when you go to confession. No, it's a meeting between you and God. And as a priest, I look forward to assisting in that encounter. God bless you. Brother, please, with those final words, could you end up with a, with a blessing for our viewers? And please. Sure. Let's say a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you came that we may have life, life to the full. And we thank you so much, Lord, for giving us the gift of your church, for the sacraments which help us to enter into the full communion that our hearts desire, to be with you now so that we may share in life with you forever. I pray, Lord, especially for our hearts that may have become hardened due to sin. I pray that you drive far away from us any fears or anxieties or anything that might prevent us from coming forward to you in trust and receiving the healing power that you alone can give. We pray that you help us grow in humility, Lord, to acknowledge our need for salvation, our need for forgiveness, from our sins and the courage to be able to say our sins out loud, to release them from the hiddenness of our hearts into the space of your divine light. And so with the prayers and blessing of the, the prayers and intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, 
may Almighty God bless and protect you. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. To all our listeners at home, God bless you all. Tony, I'll speak to you soon, guys. Take care. Good night. Good night and God bless.